nothing and it went off and you got no, no, This member decapitated. It's probably because you're trying to hide something and make sure certain details don't come out. Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life, where we talk all things true crime. If you are brand new for the first time, welcome and I hope you enjoy the channel. And for all my returning subscribers, you already know the deal, you know what we talk about, and you know how it goes. Before we jump in, don't forget to hit that subscribe button below if you are new to the channel and take a chance and see if you like what you have to hear today. All right, so I have a case for you today that is happening in real time. It just broke two days ago on Sunday, and I have to give a little bit of a trigger warning. It's a really tough one. It took me quite a while to actually read through all of these articles, to watch some of the interviews, and it, it, it hits a nerve. So I want to just give you guys some warning ahead of time. You may need to pause it throughout. You may not even be able to complete the video, but I felt like if I was feeling a certain kind of way, as I was reading through this and researching it, I would imagine that you guys as viewers are going to feel a certain kind of way. So I wanted to just be forthcoming with that information up front. With that said, today's case takes us to Houston, Texas. And as I mentioned, this happened on Sunday afternoon where three siblings were found inside their apartment alongside the remains of their nine-year-old sibling who had been decomposing right next to them. They were found with no electricity, quite literally starving, and it is just a horrific case. And as we get to the current state of where the case is, it's in my opinion, misjustice at its finest. So we are going to talk about that. Before we do so, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Hey guys, so as most of you already know, I have a toddler and now a newborn at home. So when I have a rare moment in time that I can actually just relax and unwind, it's super important for me to just turn my mind off and just have the ultimate moment of relaxation. And I'm so happy because I actually found an app on my phone that does all of that for me. And it's called Solitaire Grand Harvest. So let me break it down for you. It's themed solitaire and it's all based on harvesting your own farm. As you advance throughout the game, you go through different levels which take you to different fields and harvest new crops. And as you advance throughout the game, you uncover new maps, new crops. It's challenging, but yet calming at the same time, if that makes sense. And that's personally why I love it because I want something that not only is going to relax me, but that still is working my mind a little bit. Dr. Phil even agrees that it's super relaxing, which makes me like it even more. So let me just show you. Okay guys, so I'm about to go to the next level. I just have grown wheat. So I'm gonna hop across the field and as I go, I'm going to the next level. Okay, so I'm now on level 15 and I have 12 more levels to finish this field. You can see there are a lot of cards laid out at once. So you have to look at everything across the board and move very quickly. That's what makes this so challenging. So I'm hoping that I can pass this and get to the next level. All right, I did it. So when I'm exhausted throughout the day or when I have a tiny pocket of time to myself between shuffling the kids around, this is what I find myself doing. It is just so relaxing. I'm not gonna lie, the calming guitar music is also contributing to the relaxation factor quite a bit. It's like you're just pulling numbers, you're listening to this soothing music, you have this nice artwork. It's just a recipe for pure relaxation when you wanna unwind, at least for me. And it keeps my brain working in a process, which I love. Also, can we just talk about how cute the artwork is? Thank you, Solitaire Grand Harvest, for sponsoring today's video. And guys, go download the app, go to the link in my description box below, and you can download it right now for free. Hey, try it out for yourself and let me know what you think, but I promise you are going to love it. Thank you guys for understanding that sponsors are essential to the channel if we wanna grow it to a place where I can deliver you guys more true crime all the time. So I appreciate you understanding that. Now let's jump right into the details of this horrific case. On Sunday afternoon, police received a call and responded to an apartment complex at 3535 Greencrest, right outside of the Houston area. Upon entering the apartment, the police discovered three children who appeared to have been abandoned alongside their nine-year-old sibling whose skeletal remains were next to them. I mean, a truly horrific scene. 
These remains were not hidden. They were not concealed. They were quite literally next to the siblings as they were sitting there abandoned, alone, starving, and they had their other sibling just decomposing in front of them. How did this happen? Who was responsible? And what the hell is going on? So let's rewind a little bit back to this call, which brought the authorities to this horrific scene. And it all stemmed with that phone call on Sunday afternoon, where a 15 year old called the police and said that his nine year old brother had been dead for a year and that his body was in the room next to his. I can't even imagine what it must have been like being on the receiving end of that phone call. How do you even believe it? It's unbelievable. A 15 year old is telling you, hi, I'm abandoned inside an apartment complex and my nine-year-old brother has been dead for a year and his body is next to me. How do you wrap your mind around that? Police arrived to this apartment. Inside, they found three minors ages 15, 10, and as young as seven. As I mentioned, they were abandoned inside that apartment and it was said that they were living in absolutely deplorable conditions. The authorities say they did find those remains that were mentioned in the call next to the children and that it appeared that he had been abandoned there for an extended period of time. And he says, and I emphasize extended, meaning it very well may have been a year or more as mentioned in that initial phone call. And this is just horrible because who knows how long these children have truly been inside, abandoned in that home, but to be alongside their sibling, who they not only see as deceased when this initially happens a year or so ago, but then they see their sibling going through the stages of decomposition for a year. I can't imagine how scarring that must be, and just, it's, it's honestly ripped out of a horror movie. I can't imagine. The teenager told the deputies that he had been living inside that apartment with his two siblings for several months and that it was just them that they were completely isolated. Two youngest boys appeared malnourished and also showed signs of physical injuries. They were taken to a hospital to be assessed and treated. It was unclear if any of these kids were attending school. Reports have shown that they have been out of school for at least a minimum of a year. So they're trapped in this apartment no food, malnourished, physical injuries, no school. Who was checking on these kids? How did this go undetected? And we're going to get to that here in a minute because it just enrages me. One of the authorities states they were in there while the body was deteriorating and he was visibly disturbed as he was giving this statement. And he says in his career, he has never seen a scenario like this with such horrific circumstances and that other members of the sheriff's office were also very troubled by this case. He added that the siblings were apparently fending for each other and that the 15 year old was taking care of the two younger children who were, remember were only 10 and seven years old. Far too much responsibility, in my opinion, for a 15-year-old to have on his shoulders on his own. Uh, I'm told they range in ages from 15, 10, and 7 years old. Uh, they've been here for an extended period of time. Uh, at the same time, we also have the skeletal remains of what appears to be a juvenile. Uh, it appears to have been there for also an extended period of time. We don't know how long. That'll be part of the forensic investigation. Uh, we uh, don't know the exact age, but we anticipate again that it's the skeletal remains for a juvenile. Um, and other than that, right now, it's just very preliminary information. We're trying to identify next of kin to determine exactly what's happened and how we got to this point. Uh, but again, a, a very horrific set of circumstances. Um, and so, you know, very troubled by all this. Our members are troubled by it. But, you know, we're, we're going to make sure we do everything we can and make sure we conduct a thorough uh, follow-up investigation, make sure that the kids are okay. Uh, this will be a, a, a follow-up investigation involving multiple agencies. The apartment where the children were found had no power for at least a couple of weeks, and many neighbors, as all of this information was surfacing on Sunday, were outraged and wondering how this could truly go undetected. However, there was then a couple of neighbors who had been bringing the children food and were charging their cell phone for them. And I'm going to get into a few quotes by those neighbors and share my thoughts on that afterwards. One of the neighbors named Erica Chapman states, the first time I saw him, he was sleeping on one of the slides. And she says that she would bring food to the 15 year old. She said she knew something was wrong because his mother was rarely home and that she started giving him food six months ago. She says that she would come and park and that he would run down and grab noodles, drinks, and chips and run back up. 
She said that he wouldn't accept cooked meals. He would only take packaged snacks, fruit, and pizza. Now, my first question here is, if you're bringing this 15-year-old food for six months because you know that there's something going on, whether there's somebody home or not, to the degree of him needing food and you needing to supply it for him, did you keep that information to yourself? Did you call CPS? Did you call somebody? Did you report this? Six months is a long time to be, I don't care what kind of neighbor you are, how nice you are to them, to be delivering food because you know that they wouldn't be getting sufficient food elsewhere. So why weren't further steps taken? And it wasn't just this neighbor. Trevor Thompson also speaks out and he says that he would also provide the teenager with food. He described him as paranoid and said that he was afraid of getting poisoned, which is why they would only accept certain food and packaged food. And this makes me suspect that if they are so scared of being poisoned, have they been poisoned in the past as to why they're only accepting packaged food i can't imagine that somebody would have warned them only take packaged food otherwise there is a chance that you could be poisoned because for somebody to give that warning they would clearly have to be concerned with their well-being which if they were abandoned they weren't concerned with their well-being so why were they so concerned about point being poisoned and making sure that the food they did receive and accept was packaged Trevor Thompson goes on to say, a few times I noticed the lights weren't on and it was quiet upstairs. So I figured there was trouble because the parents haven't been there in a while. One day he came and knocked on the door and asked if he could use the phone charger and we built a bond from there. I started offering him food because I knew he needed more than just a charger. Again, if you see that there's a problem, why aren't you in investigating more, intervening, figuring out what the root of this horrific situation is? You know they need food. You know they need a charger, whether it's because they don't have electricity or don't have a charger themselves. Like, wh why wasn't this followed up on more diligently is my biggest, biggest question here. Both Erica Chapman and Trevor Thompson go on to say that they were unaware of the secrets and horror that was happening inside that apartment and that they didn't even know there were two other brothers living there and no less one deceased brother living there. They thought it was just the teen. Did he tell you that he had any brothers? Never. Why do you think he didn't tell people he had these brothers? After finding out what happened yesterday, I think he was more nervous and scared. Hey, are they going to blame me for this? Are my parents going to punish me for this? Actually, did you like the first piece of that I bought you? He said, what, the first one that we had? And that kind of made me wonder, why would he say we? Because I've always thought he was there by himself. Still, just the teen or not, clearly there were red flags. I don't understand why it wasn't followed up on. And I know I keep saying that. It just gets to me so badly. The mother of the children, who has been identified as Gloria Williams, as well as her boyfriend, were located late on Sunday night. They were being interviewed by homicide investigators, but on Monday, they were released and not charged. Released and not charged. Now, this is the part where I'm saying this case still has not received the justice that it needs because... How are you released and not charged? How are there not, at minimum, charges for child neglect, for the remains that were still in the apartment, whether it was an accidental death or not, you know, concealment of remains, whatever is going on? Like, how are there not any charges in this case? The police found three minors who were malnourished, had physical injury, and who were abandoned. On top of that, they found another alleged minor who had been decomposing for nearly a year. How do you just walk from charges and from any sort of accountability for that. Please, if you have the answer, comment and let me know below. As of Monday, the three minor children were with CPS and they were in CPS custody and the agency was seeking emergency custody of these children. And the statement that they gave was, to ensure the safety of the children, the Department of Family and Protective Services is seeking emergency custody of the three boys. CPS does have a history with the family. The details of that are still a little bit unclear. However, we do know that there was no active CPS investigation at the time the children were discovered alone in the apartment on Sunday afternoon. So if they had a history with CPS, but there was no active investigation, I understand why there weren't regular checks happening. But again, at that point, I think it's the duty and responsibility of the neighbors to intervene when they see that something is clearly wrong. A removal hearing is now taking place in family court, and that has yet to be scheduled. They're not releasing the names of the three children, obviously, because they're minors, but we do know that they are right now in protective custody. Now, my biggest question is, with the alleged neglect, and I say that 
alleged because even though, I mean, hello, the writing is on the wall. I say that because they haven't been convicted or charged with anything. But with the circumstances of the alleged neglect, and again, going back to the remains of their deceased brother, regardless how that death took place, now that the mother and the boyfriend have not been charged, we already know that there is a pattern of them fleeing because they fled the children. They abandoned them with no electricity, no food, nothing. And next, obviously, without a care for their well-being because they left them there inside the home with their decomposing brother. So what's to say they're not going to flee now? Now that they have been released and not charged, what's to say and who's to say that they're not going to go into hiding or go to Mexico or go somewhere else where they can't be found? They don't have kids that they're responsible for, not that they did initially, I guess, but now that the kids are with protective custody, they don't have, they're not court ordered anywhere. So what are the next steps from here? I'm really eager to know what you guys think about this case. Please comment below. Let me know how you think that the mother and the boyfriend were released without being charged. I I'm very curious to know your thoughts there. And let me know your thoughts on this case in general. How did we get to this point. Why didn't the 15-year-old call sooner? Why did it take a year to call? Were was it were they were they scared? Were they, you know, was it a fear tactic of the mother when she left saying don't call anybody? So and then they finally did. I mean, it certainly is absolutely not their fault, but I'm just curious as to how such a long period of time has gone by in which nobody saw what was going on and intervened. It just it blows my mind and it, it really stumps me. So please leave your thoughts below because I'm really interested to hear what you guys think about this and what you have to say. As I said earlier in the video, this case is sticking with me. So I'm going to be following it diligently and I will keep you updated. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so that you get notified of those updates if you want to keep up with the case as well. And you'll get notified as new details emerge or if I go live with an update in this case. As always, you can also join our 24-7 group chat on Discord where we talk about all things true crime, all cases. If I'm not able to just jump on here right away and do a video, that's the best place and the quickest place to have information and to talk with each other about these cases. And you can join Discord by clicking that link in the description box below. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to today's case with me. I know it was a tough one. I appreciate you listening. And please don't forget to share your thoughts below. I am just praying that justice is served in this case and that these children go to a loving, caring family, that we get some more answers with the neighbors and why there was no accountability there and why nobody intervened. I mean, I, there's just so many unanswered questions here. So thank you for sticking through this and listening with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. And don't forget, on your way out, please give this video a thumbs up and leave your comments and your feedback below. Until the next case, stay safe.